3D printing. It's changing the way we make things. It's changing the way we make things. Why should we care? How many of you enjoy making things? Raise your hand. Right? The lights are blinding me, but I can still tell that there's a lot of hands that are being raised in the audience. Like you, I enjoy making things. And Nigel, with his kind introduction, reminded you that I grew up pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and when I was, while I was growing up, one of the things I loved to do was to make things. Um, I remember spending many, many days as a kid outside in the stream beside our house, and one of the things I would make um, is dams to build, to back up the water. So I'd use sand and rocks, and one day my dad showed me where there was some clay I could find, and I was so excited because I could make even taller dams. I can only imagine what the fish downstream must have been thinking. One moment they were flapping around wondering if they were going to live, and then the next moment, jubilation! Her dam just sprung a leak, right? So making things. There's something very fundamental, almost essential, I think, about human beings in that we enjoy making things. Social scientists have even run experiments to document the effect. If you have two identical objects in front of you, one of them you made yourself and the other was made by an expert, you'll place greater value on the object that you made yourself. And you will put greater value on it even uh, if it has flaws, if it's not as good as the one that the expert made. So there's something very fundamental about making things and human beings, right? So if you enjoy making things, then you are living in the right place at the right time because 3D printing is promising to give us a new way to make things, right? So 3D printing is the process of making almost anything you can imagine right in front of your very eyes. Some tech experts, including Chris Anderson, the editor of Wired, have called this the next industrial revolution. That's a pretty formidable statement. So we, before we start talking about industrial revolutions, let's learn a little bit about what 3D printing is. Right? So 3D printing starts with a digital file, so it needs to be a computer representation of something that you'd like to make. You could make that object yourself um, if you're skilled enough with 3D software. You can also download objects from the web, of course. Some sites like Shapeways will allow you to pick an object you like. They'll make it for you and mail it to you. Other objects, here I'm showing an object on Thingiverse, which I've also got in my pocket. Let me see if I can find it. Here it is. Will allow you to download things that you like and then make it yourself. So how does this process work? There are many, many different types of 3D printing technologies. Essentially, the machines can range from a do-it-yourself kit that you put together for a few hundred dollars all the way up to a machine that may cost a million or more dollars which would have much more precise capabilities than you might like to have in your home. The thing that's fundamental about all these technologies is that they build things additively and what does that mean? They put material only where it's needed and they typically build objects up layer by layer by layer. And that's very different from the way we conventionally think about making things, isn't it? So if you thought about making a piece of furniture, a decoration from a piece of wood, you'll start with a block, right? And you'll start removing and carving things away. We do that all the time in engineering when we machine parts. You could also think about the cell phone case that might be in your pocket or the case of your computer mouse. And those things were probably made by molding, right? Not that much different from taking a specialty pan and baking a cake in it, right? You get the object that you like. Uh, the problem is that it's very expensive to make a mold and you're not going to change that very much. With 3D printing, on the other hand, you can make anything you can create a computer file of and you can build it up layer by layer. So let me show you how a very fundamental, one, a very, one of the most simple processes working it works. It's a material extrusion process. So let's take a look at how it works. So this particular process is going to build the rocket that I have in my hand. It's going to build it. This is a MakerBot machine that's available commercially. It costs about $2,000 to purchase. The material that's in this object in my hand is costs about a dollar, maybe even less. There's a spool of plastic wire uh, behind this machine. The wire, the spool looks a lot like maybe a, a, raw, a, a spool of fishing line might look, only it's a little bit bigger and the wire has a bigger dia diameter. It's being extruded through a nozzle, and you can see a gold nozzle there. That nozzle is heated, so the plastic comes in in a solid form. The nozzle melts it, so it's a liquid form, and then deposits it either on the build platform, which is blue here, or as it starts building layer by layer, it will deposit it on uh, the previous layer. And that liquid plastic then will cool in time for the next layer to come along. 
So why are people calling this the next industrial revolution? What does it really do for making things for human beings? Well, if you think about how we made things before the first industrial revolution, you'll think about very artistic ways of making things, very craftsman types of things. So on the left-hand side here, you've got a clock from one of my favorite museums, which is the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford. And this particular clock was handmade, as everything was at the time. Then along came the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the steam engine, right? electricity, assembly lines, transportation networks. And all of a sudden, we started to mass produce things. right? So we build them in great quantities. Why do we do this? We do this because many of the things we use to build things now are very capital intensive. So we take a clock now, like the one in the center, and we build it using molding techniques, right? And each mold may easily take tens of thousands of dollars to build, or maybe even hundreds of thousands if it's a complex, a very complex mold. And that may sound like a lot of money, and it is, but it's not a lot of money if you're going to make hundreds of thousands or even millions of these parts, because in that case, when you average out the cost of the mold, uh, the parts no longer cost all that much. They don't cost much more to make than just the material that's going into those parts. Then along comes additive manufacturing. And you can get the clock that's on the right, which was designed and built by some of the students that I have at the University of Texas. And that clock is additively manufactured, right? It takes the advantages of the pre-industrial revolution age, right? We're building things that are unique, one of a kind. But we don't have to take as long. They're not as time consuming or as labor intensive as those original processes were. So it sort of blends the best of both worlds. So what are we 3D printing now? How is it impacting uh, our daily lives? People are using 3D printing to do one of a kind fabrication. So on your left, you'll see uh, one of my favorite artists, Olaf Giegel, and some guitars that he has built using 3D printing. You can see the very intricate designs. On the right is, a, is an application that I think is really cool. Uh, there's a company in Central Texas called Harvest Technologies that builds parts using 3D printing for people. Uh, and this particular part was built for a television show called Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Maybe some of you have seen it before. Uh, they take a family that's deserving of a new home, they spirit them away for a couple of weeks for a vacation, and while they're gone, they build them a new house and surprise them with it when they come home. This particular family had a blind son who obviously couldn't see what the house looked like and needed to learn his way around. And so the way they managed to do that in this case was they 3D printed a model of the house so that this particular boy could feel his way around the arrangement of the house before he even went in. Some of my students, I have some parts here that we've built uh, with some of my students and some of the people in my research group. Um, this is an example of a part um, that you'll notice. This is an example of, again, of a one-of-a-kind fabrication. Um, this is an example of the gravitational fields, a three-dimensional model of the gravitational fields around the Earth and the Moon. And there are a lot of software tools that we could use to help us kind of visualize what's going on in these gravitational fields, sort of the uh, bending of space-time around these objects, but not a lot of three-dimensional models. And so this is an example of one of those, right? This is an example of an energy harvester that some of my students also designed and built and put together. It clips on a bridge and uses energy from the vibration of the bridge to create electrical power, which could then be used to power sensors, for example, to monitor the health of the bridge. So one-of-a-kind fabrication is one thing we're looking at. Another thing is personal customization, making things that are specific to an individual application or specific to an individual person. Uh, some people may not know one of the most popular styles of braces in the United States right now is called Invisalign. Um, what you do is you go to your dentist, they take an impression of your teeth, and then based on that impression, they can create a digital file that represents the geometry of your mouth. And from that, they can 3D print molds that will create dental uh, braces just for you. Uh, one of a kind. They make uh, 35, 40,000 of these a day using 3D printing. On the right-hand side, you'll see uh, this kind of uh, piggybacks off of Joel's presentation earlier. You'll see a prosthetic. Some researchers at the University of Texas are working on being able to scan individuals' residual limbs when they've lost part of their limb, and then using that geometry to then create the inside, to build the inside of a custom-fit prosthetic for that person. Functional complexity. So because additive manufacturing allows us to put material exactly where we want it, complex shapes, uh, we can do things with parts that we weren't able to do before. 
And so on your left hand side, you'll see a simple bracket that's used on an aircraft to help hold on the, a door, a service door for one of the engines. And the upper image is a traditional bracket, right? Typically made either by casting or by machining. And then in the bottom, you'll see uh, the newly designed bracket that takes advantage of additive manufacturing. So what they've done in that spider web type of image is they've taken away material where they don't need it. So the new bracket is just as stiff as the old one was in the places where they need it, but it's much lighter. And every kilogram that you save in weight on an aircraft can translate into $100,000 in fuel savings over the lifetime of that craft. So a lot of the things that we do in my research group as well deal with functional complexity and using the ability of 3D printing right, to put material anywhere we want it to make unique things. On the right is a cross-sectional view of an aircraft wing that we de design. This is for really small scale surveillance aircraft, the type you could hold in your hands. And this particular wing is made out of a flexible material that allows you to fold it up and then actually inflate it when you're ready to use it so the soldier can kind of put it in their pocket until they're ready to use it. We're designing and building new types of materials as well, Honeco materials that could go into things like helmets or, or shields that can absorb energy and then bounce back when they're done so they're ready for the next hit. So where do we go from here? There are many new frontiers. People are starting to think about printing organs for people. On the right hand side here you'll see um, a bladder. The scaffold or the framework for that bladder was 3D printed and then it was populated with cells from uh, the very person who was scheduled to receive the bladder. You can create then organs on demand, right? Uh, and they don't even suffer from the rejection problems that you would have if you brought an organ from another person. People are using the same sorts of processes that I showed a video of earlier to do things like um, 3D printed ears. You can see one here on the left. Um, they can print with one nozzle, they can print gel with cartilage tissue inside. With another nozzle, they can print um, metallic types of materials. And lo and behold, they can print an antenna inside of an ear that can capture radio waves and help you hear. People are building food. And a friend of mine at, at Cornell University, Hod Lipson, says that the next killer app for 3D printing is food. Uh, and so in his lab, they can create wonderful chocolates, right? You can imagine having um, a chocolate souvenir for your next wedding where the chocolates look exactly like the bride and the groom. Um, they're making, <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good thing or not. Um, they're making, uh, you know, cookies and, and chocolates and cakes and candies with special messages inside that you can't see until you print, take them open. Other people are working on using you know, sugars to create intricate edible types of designs. People are working on machines that will print several different types of materials um, and even into an oven that can cook them as they're being printed. Other new frontiers, you can print almost anything you imagine, but the trick is that you have to get a digital file of that part before you can print it. And for many of us who are engineers, that's not such a big deal because I know how to use this software and I've been specially trained in it. For other people, that's a barrier. And I think we're going to see over the next few years, we're going to see a revolution um, in the software industry to try to accommodate this desire of people to make things on 3D printers. So let me give you an example of what I mean. On the left-hand side here, you will see a clay sculpture of a human hand. And that was created by some students in one of my courses at the University of Texas. What they wanted to do was then take that clay sculpture and be able to 3D print it. On the right, you will see a digital file, almost ready for 3D printing, that was created by taking their smartphone and taking a series of pictures all the way around that hand. And so you can kind of see the little squares in there that represent where they took pictures. And a piece of software called 123D then compiled those pictures into a three-dimensional model of that hand. And so then we can 3D print it and we can make as many copies as we like. But we need more software tools like this. This software tool still has bugs that need to be advanced so that people can go more easily from their ideas to a 3D printed creation. There are other new frontiers. I think uh, if you think about 2D printing, there are a lot of analogies to 3D printing in the future. That's my prediction. Think about 2D printing, just a printer that you might have in your home right now. Right? You probably use those to print all sorts of everyday items. And they're fairly inexpensive, right? You can buy one for a couple of hundred dollars US. 
Um, but if you want to build something, if you want to print something specialty, let's say you want to print a large color banner, or maybe you'd like to print some specialty invitations for a wedding or a special event, then you'll probably use a professional printer who has a printer that might cost several hundred thousand dollars uh, to, make that, to make that print for you. I think we're going to see 3D printing moving in the same direction. You can already purchase 3D printers for home use. You can actually purchase some pretty good ones like the one that you saw in my video for about $2,000. I think that price is going to drop. But I think we'll start using those personal 3D printers at home to build interesting things we'd like to have around the house. And if we want to build something of really high functionality, say a replacement part for our car, we might ask someone with a professional 3D printer that costs a lot more money to simply make that part for us. In my research group at the University of Texas, we're working on something we call the 3D printing vending machine. And this is an artist's rendering of this, complete with what we think uh, clothing might like, look like in 2030, I think, uh, with our futuristic looking user. Uh, there. This is really inspired by some work by a friend of mine, Christopher Williams at Virginia Tech, who also created a vending machine. And what we're trying to do with this is to give students at the University of Texas the ability to upload files digitally and then walk up to this printer and watch them being made right before their very eyes. The printer will eject the part into a retrieval bay and they'll just be able to pick it up and walk away. Right? So I think we're going to see a lot of new frontiers in how we make things and how we have access to 3D printing. So what will you make? Right. What will you make over the course of your lifetime? Right? M many things I would like to predict. So you could, for example, buy a personal 3D printer and you could make jewelry for yourself. Right? So this was made on a personal 3D printer. Maybe what you'll do is you'll print toys for your kids. Right? Maybe something will break around the house and you'll print replacement parts for it, for your blender, for your car, what have you. Maybe you or a friend will be walking around with 3D printed organs, right, that your body doesn't reject. The possibilities, I think, are endless. It's a very good time to be a maker.